Welcome back students. This is chapter 11 on DNA mutation, DNA repair, and something known as homologous recombination. The first thing about mutations is that they always involve DNA. The second thing about mutations is that they're very rare. Nature has to balance the rate of mutation with the rate of evolution. And the last thing is they are random. Mutation rates are an important indicator of the level of DNA change. By counting the number of mutations affecting a phenotype, that gives you an estimate of the mutation rate. And then also determining the frequency of which mutations are affecting each base pair is another commodity. So at the phenotypic level, the mutation rates do vary between different organisms, but the average seems to be somewhere between one in a million to one in a hundred million bases. At the DNA level, the mutation rate is much lower at one in a billion per replicated base pair. So what's the difference between the two? Well, as we know, DNA carries the information, but not all areas of the DNA are used for making product. In fact, the vast majority of the DNA is not used for making product. Therefore, those mutations will not show up at this level. Thus, discrepancy between the two values. Regions of the DNA with elevated levels of mutation do exist, and they are known as mutation hotspots. One reason, particularly when it comes to genes themselves, is that large genes have more region to be affected, more DNA. Therefore, they would be natural hotspots. Two of the largest genes that humans possess are the gene for Duchenne muscular dystrophy and the gene for neurofibromatosis. Due to their large size, they have an overall mutation rate of about 1 in a 10,000. One of the earlier questions to be asked in the field of genetics was, does the environment cause mutations? or do mutations cause evolution? This was answered by some clever experiments performed in 1943 by Laurier and Delbruck's. They called their test the fluctuation test, and they were evaluating the relationship between bacteria and their resistance to bacteriophage, which are viruses that infect these bacteria. At the time, there were two major hypotheses in circulation. The first one was the random mutation hypothesis, which predicted that different bacterial cultures would develop resistance to these bacteriophage at different times, therefore producing variable numbers of resistant bacteria at the end of a certain time period. The other theory was the adaptive mutation hypothesis, which assumed that the presence of the bacteriophage would induce mutations in the bacteria, therefore giving rise to about equal numbers of bacteria that were resistant to the viruses in each of the cultures tested. In the first experiment, the random mutation hypothesis, they would have found that by the fourth generation, different cultures would have produced different resistant populations of bacteria. In the adaptive mutation hypothesis, they would have found that every culture that they examined should have produced equivalent numbers of resistant bacteria. So 3 plus 2, 5 in culture C, 3 in culture B, 3 in culture A. The actual results supported the top random mutation hypothesis, which basically means that the mutations already existed in the bacteria to become resistant to the virus. And if the virus was present, the resistance was just a benefit. Another important commodity to consider, especially for multicellular creatures that reproduce sexually, is where does the mutation originate? The two locations are germ cells, otherwise known as germline mutations, and somatic cells, known as somatic mutations. Germline mutations are passed on from one generation to the next, whereas somatic mutations 
are only carried by that individual and the direct descendants of those cells through mitosis. When the individual dies, the mutation will die with them. The smallest level of DNA change happens at the nucleotide level. These are called point mutations because a single point on the DNA is affected. In addition to a change known as a substitution, bases can be added or removed. The consequences of point mutations are dependent on where they happen to occur. Sometimes they can happen inside the gene, other times in the regulatory part of the genome, and other times in repetitive DNA or non-important DNA known as junk DNA. Thus their location is very important. Table 11.1 .1 outlines the types of mutations that can occur in coding sequences versus regulatory. Here's some commonly used terminology when it comes to mutations, especially point mutations, base pair substitution mutations, the replacement of one base by another. It could happen at a single point or several points. Transition mutations, where the purine is replaced by another purine, or a pyrimidine replaces another pyrimidine. And transversions are pyrimidine replacing a purine and vice versa. The substitution of bases can result in three effects. One is a synonymous mutation that does not alter the resulting amino acid. And we can explain that due to the redundancy of the genetic code. Some amino acids are coded by multiple codons. Therefore, they would have no impact on the right amino acid being brought to the polypeptide. Missense mutations do result in an amino acid change. And nonsense mutations result in the creation of a premature stop codon that then affects the length of the polypeptide. Figure 11.2 shows a wild type sequence of DNA and the corresponding messenger RNA and polypeptide produced from it. In synonymous mutations, you can see that the correct amino acid is still being incorporated into the polypeptide. In a nonsense mutation, there's a change in the amino acid from the wild type to the mutant. And in nonsense mutations, the production of a stop codon stops further translation of the polypeptide. The result of adding or removing bases results in frame shift mutations. The biggest consequence of frame shift mutations is an alteration in the reading frame of the messenger RNA by the ribosome. The wrong amino acid sequence is produced starting at the point of the mutation and if by chance stop codons are generated, should the switch place stop codon bases next to each other. Frame shift mutations are relayed by figure 11.3. Once again, here's the wild type sequence and its consequences. Frame shift mutations re uh, incorporating an insertion of a single base in this example results in a shifting of the reading frame and a stop codon just happens to be produced by that effect. And of course, deletions of a single base can also produce a stop codon, but in this example they haven't, but they have caused a change in every amino acid after that point. Unlikely that that protein will work. As we alluded a little earlier, the mutation could affect the regulatory components of a gene. If the mutation is localized to the promoter, the introns, the five primed or three primed untranslated regions, then there may be a change in the amount of gene product rather than its absence. Three types of regulatory mutations are recognized. The first is a promoter mutation. Promoter mutations may knock out the consensus sequence, making it less effective and a few cases more effective. And these are called promoter mutations. 
and they of course interfere with initiation of transcription. Depending on the position of the mutation, the product of the gene may be completely missing or have no effect whatsoever or something in between. Here are some mutations discovered for the human beta globin gene at its regulatory promoter. So these numbers are minus because we're upstream of the transcription start site. So these will be within the promoter region. Some of these will have a greater effect than the others. The second category is splicing mutations. So efficient splicing of an intron from messenger RNA requires, as we saw in a previous chapter, specific sequences at the boundary of the intron, as well as that A that forms the lariat. So mutations that alter these nucleotides are called splicing mutations. And they can result in splicing errors and the production of mutant proteins and the retention of intron sequences that should have been cut out. A great example is presented again by studying the introns of the human beta globin gene. So this is a representation of mutations in intron 1. So here's intron 1 and here's exon 1. And you can see the consensus sequence is affected and therefore the amount of normal transcript produced compared to the wild type on top is none because you're changing the G to something else and that G is absolutely necessary for the spliceosome to do its job. But then there are other regions within the consensus that may or may not affect the rate of intron splicing. So we have reduced effects here and we have no transcript produced with this C. The third type is the generation of cryptic splice sites. So base pair substitutions could introduce this sequence somewhere else by random mutation. And one of those mutations can produce a new splice site that replaces or competes with the authentic splice site. Remember, the spliceosome is scanning the messenger RNA looking for a splice site and it finds them by sequence. And if a sequence accidentally materializes, then that will be used as a splice site. So those are called cryptic splice sites. The top represents the wild type condition. And this is the authentic splice site on the end of intron 1 before exon 2 begins. But the mutation has converted this G into an A and now this resembles the splice site. And this is now going to be used. Therefore, this part of the intron is left inside the exon and that will then produce additional amino acids when this is translated. Mutations at the far end of the gene in the polyadenylation region can also have consequences. The mutations normally block the proper processing of the three primed end of the messenger RNA, therefore leading to a shorter life expectancy once it leaves the nucleus, if it indeed can leave the nucleus. With reference to the wild type sequence, the normal sequence in that population, a forward mutation converts the wild type DNA to a mutant DNA. If it's a gene, it converts the wild type allele to a mutant allele. Thus, the word reverse mutation must mean the opposite. That means it converts a mutant allele back to the wild type. But sometimes, not entirely, so we call them near wild type alleles. A true reversion in the genetic sense restores the wild type DNA sequence, but not by reversion, but by a second mutation within the same codon. Here is an example of a true reversion. The original amino acid was leucine. The mutant amino acid has become phenylalanine. The reversant doesn't take the C back to an A. What it does is converts the T, the first T, into a C. And that leads to the coding for 
the same amino acid just by chance? Leucine. Two other types of reversion that students of genetics must be aware of. There's something called an intragenic reversion. Think about it. Intra means within. Genic means gene. So within the gene, a reversion can happen. This is a second mutation somewhere else in the gene that restores the functionality of the gene. Whereas a second site reversion is a mutation that occurs in a different gene that compensates for the original mutation, restoring, as far as the phenotype of the organism is concerned, the organism back to wild type. The second site reversion is also known in genetic circles as a suppressor mutation. Suppressor mutation. Because the second mutation suppresses the first. These definitions and terminologies make more sense in the historical understanding of how genetics developed with the limited number of experiments and tools available in the past. An example of intragenic reversion is given by 11.6b. Here's a mutation that results from the deletion of two bases. So there's a frame shift mutation. But just by chance, another mutation has occurred that's inserted two bases somewhere else, close by, therefore restoring the reading frame and generating a viable product in terms of a protein. 11.6c has the second site reversion example. Let's look at the phenotype first. So the wild type flower has a dark blue flower. The mutant generated from it is a light blue flower. But the second site reversion restores the phenotype back to the dark blue flower, even though different genes have been affected. So gene A has been knocked out here in the first mutation. But just by chance, uh, gene B has a mutation that increases its ability to utilize and deposit pigment, and that restores the color. Why do mutations occur in the first instance? The answer is, well, it happens. Spontaneous mutations occur in cells without prior exposure to substances that induce mutations. And these arise primarily due to errors in DNA replication or chemical structural changes caused by just vibrational energy or thermal energy inside a cell. We may know by now how efficient DNA replication is. It's a very high fidelity process. Regardless, there is still some room for error. Those are called replication errors. And they occur one in a billion in E. coli and about the same in us. The reason being that once DNA is replicated, there's a proof reading ability built into the polymerase, as well as a mechanism that follows the replication bubble, forks, where they do mismatch repair, these enzymes. Multiple insertions and deletions of nucleotides occur particularly at nucleotide repeat hotspots in the DNA. That's because the DNA polymerase gets disorientated and the fact that it falls off the template and the template forms a hairpin, as indicated here, is responsible for introducing, in this case, a bunch of additional repeats. So the repeats are three nucleotides. We have six of them to begin with. We should have six at the end in the new DNA, but because the RNA Sorry, because the DNA polymerase falls off the template here and then the template forms a hairpin because of the instability, then the DNA climbs back on back here and copies it again accidentally. Therefore, now we have 11 repeats in this example rather than the six originally. This strand slippage that we just saw is important because it can lead to trinucleotide repeat expansion disorders. Basically, um, 
there's a correlation between the number of repeats and the severity of a disease. There may be a cutoff below which there's no disease and above which there is disease with respect to the number of repeats. So increasing the number of repeats beyond the threshold causes the disorder. One can clearly see multiple examples of this as illustrated in 11.2. So this is the normal range of repeats that the human population should have. But if humans have more repeats than their parents or other members of the community, then they will develop the disease. Another source of mutation is when the two strands of DNA do not carry complementary base pairs. These are called mispaired nucleotides. The examples would include the purine and guanine going with the pyrimidine thymine and the pyrimidine cytosine going with the purine adenine. These are placed by the DNA replication machine therefore they're called incorporation errors. Now they may be repaired by the mismatch repair system that we'll talk about later. But if that system misses it, then further replication of these incorporated mistakes will lead to mutations. And those are called replicated error mutations. That sequence of events is revealed here. This is the wild type. This is where the error has been incorporated. And this is where the error has not been fixed. There was a chance to fix the error at this point, but it wasn't, and the DNA was replicated. Another source of spontaneous nucleotide changes is depurination, the loss of a purine from the nucleotide. That just leaves the sugar and the phosphate. So when a base is lost, there's a hole in the DNA helix, and that's called a A purinic site because the base that's normally lost is a purine. Most of these are discovered and fixed as indicated on the next slide 11.9 but first we'll show you what we mean. So the green structure is the base on this nucleotide and the bond between the carbon 1 and the nitrogen of the base has been broken, the covalent bond, and the base floats away. Therefore, we have a depurination event. You can see that happening right here. And then DNA replication takes place, and the machine recognizes that there's a gap in there, and a A adenine is placed in the slot opposite. During the next round of DNA replication, the bottom strand now contains a different base to the original wild type, which happened to be a C in the past. And when that's uh, replicated, it will now introduce an AT base pair. Another spontaneous chemical event is deamination. Deamination means the loss of an amino group from the nucleotide. And this is quite common for cytosine to be deaminated. And an oxygen atom normally takes its place, converting the cytosine to a uracil. That's no problem because there's a mechanism that recognizes the uracil should not be present in DNA, and that restores the cytosine. This is the sole difference between uracil and cytosine. In cytosine, we have an amino group, and in uracil, we have an oxygen. Fortunately, there's another form of cytosine that may exist in DNA that's been tagged. That's called methylated cytosine. If that gets deaminated, then unfortunately, it looks like a thymine. And that will then be paired with guanine. An opportunity for repair does exist. But if that fails, then the GT base pair will be replicated and then one sister chromatid will have an AT base pair and the other one will have a GC base pair. Here's your deamination of 5-methylcytosine which then looks like a thymine. This is your deamination result of the preceding explanation that leads to transitions 
Mutations can also be caused by ionizing radiation and chemicals. Any agent that causes DNA damage leading to mutations is called a mutagen. Now the induced mutations produced by mutagens can be done both in the natural setting or an experimental setting. And it's the experimental setting that has resulted in most of our knowledge about how mutagens affect DNA in specific ways to produce particular sequences. And indeed, some laboratories use mutagens to induce mutations for the purposes of generating aberrant organisms. The types of chemical mutagens are listed here. So they are nucleotide base analogs that mimic nucleotides and are not recognized by the repair system and accepted by DNA polymerase. They are deaminating agents, alkanating agents, oxidizing agents, hydroxylating agents, intercalating agents. Here is a list of some of those chemicals. Some may be obvious. A problematic nucleotide base analog is 5-bromodeoxyuridine, which acts as a replacement for thymine. You can see its structure is very similar to a regular thymine. It can form two hydrogen bonds with adenine, and it has the necessary atoms in the right places to maintain the width of the DNA double helix at 2 nanometers. Deaminating agents remove amino groups from nucleotide bases. That's a problem for adenine because nitrous acid produces something called hypoxanthine, and that can mispair with cytosine and after DNA replication can lead to base pair substitutions, as shown here. Alkylating agents such as EMS can add bulky side groups such as ethyl groups, and that interferes with base pairing by distorting the double helix. Here we have an ethyl group added to this base. Intercalating agents are also known, and they insert themselves into the DNA double helix between the base pairs, such. And that changes the dimensions of the double helix, and that can result in distortions that lead to frame shift mutations. Natural radiation, as well as artificial radiation, can also induce DNA damage. Photo products are aberrant structures with additional bonds involving nucleotides. So a thymine dimer would be a photo product, and that's induced by UV radiation. Neighboring thymines bond together, and that bonding prevents the replication machinery from bypassing and copying this region. So here we have two forms of thymine dimers. There are many, many other forms of chemical changes that can take place to DNA, but those are outside the scope of this book. Next, we move on to the Ames test. The Ames test was developed by Bruce Ames as a test to discover how mutagenic a substance was. I think he was asked to test whether a food product was mutagenic or not, and he devised this test. It relies on bacteria being exposed to these compounds in the presence of mammalian liver enzymes. Bruce thought that the liver enzymes were important because once we consume something, it goes straight from the digestive system across the blood, and the first place the blood travels to is the liver, where the enzymes of the liver may convert that chemical into something more dangerous. So that's the logic behind including the liver enzymes. A number of different bacteria can be used in the Ames test, including E. coli, but the most commonly used is the original, a strain of Salmonella known as Salmonella typhimorium. The interesting thing is 
that the bacteria used are already mutants. They are mutant in the ability to use an important amino acid in their survival. So unless you give them this histidine, they're going to die. So the test involves taking these bacteria, exposing them to the chemical, then plating them out, hoping that the chemical would have reversed the original mutation at exactly the right point. And only those bacteria will form colonies. Now, the more colonies that you form, the more dangerous the original substance was because it induced a lot of revertence. So in genetics parlance, we have reversion mutations, which convert the H- minus histidine- minus bacteria to the histidine wild type. And that's what he was looking for. Other strains of bacteria that contain different classes of mutation are available, and they can be used to test the ability of that compound to perform that type of mutagenic event. Aflatoxin is a substance produced by fungi, and it's a great problem inside grain silos where the fungus can sometimes penetrate. So farmers are required to test for aflatoxin, especially the B1. So these are the actual results obtained from an AIMS test. When tested with the bacterial strains that contain frameship mutations, the results suggest that this is not a chemical that's dangerous at all. However, testing it with a different strain, TA100, shows the true danger of aflatoxin B1. This would be for base pair substitution mutations. The next section of the video will look at DNA repair systems. Thank you.